We spent much of the last month celebrating the men and women of NASA who dared to go where many had not before. Ultimately, stepping on the moon to win the space race against the Soviet Union, one of the men with the front row seat, literally, to a lot of what went on during that space race and beyond, Jeff Carr, literally grew up inside with the view of the space program. Good to meet you. It's a pleasure. Talk about this. Your father was an astronaut. And so he as was. a kid, when you first thing you knew, you knew your dad was an astronaut. What was it like growing up in that environment during a time when we were in the middle of trying to do what we were doing in space? Well, when our family arrived here in Houston in 1966, my first thought was, what have you done? <laughs> We've moved to Africa. It was so hot. And it, it was, a, it was a, Where are you moving from? We moved from Southern California. Oh, okay. Well, you know, 70 yeah, degrees. To the and the banks sunny. of the bayou down yeah. there, right? <laughs> And, you know, so we were learning about cicadas and, and all kinds of other unique attributes of our, our lovely hometown here. Um, but it was, a, it was a wonderful place to be. It, it was room to roam. Right. Uh, you know, the, there was a little sleepy fishing village down on, on the bay called Seabrook, and then some communities like El Lago and Nassau Bay and Timber Cove that were growing up around the lakes. And once uh, NASA had decided to build the Manned Spacecraft Center, uh, on the land that used to belong to the uh, the West Ranch, mm -hmm. then Humble Oil, and then Rice University, and then uh, the, Mar the Manned Spacecraft Center, um, they began to build Clear Lake City, right. uh, which was, you know, that was the advent of the Friendswood Development Company, and a, a, a city virtually grew up around the Manned Spacecraft Center. So your father, Gerald, was, he came in with an idea that he was going to be one of the Apollo astronauts. Was that the initial assignment? Indeed. Yes. He, he came in as, uh, as one of the Apollo astronaut groups, and um, he, he had the good fortune to work as the Capcom in mission control uh, for Apollo 8, mm -hmm. our first trip around the moon, and uh, then again on Apollo 12. Mm -hmm. uh, he was scheduled to fly uh, as the lunar module pilot on Apollo 19. Mm -hmm. But as you may know, uh, Congress saw fit to cancel funding right. for the last three flights of the Apollo program. And he was then uh, instead assigned to the Skylab. How aware were you of the kinds of things that he was in line to do when you were growing up? It, it was interesting. My, my level of awareness evolved as I, as I grew older. I remember, for instance, um, the Apollo 1 fire uh, and how it sort of uh, traumatized yet galvanized our community uh, around the tra tragic loss of uh, three of our neighbors and friends. Uh, that's when the, 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 the risk associated with the business my dad was in became very real. Mm -hmm. um, but then there was Apollo 8 when I was, you know, a couple blocks behind playing with Glenn Anders. You know, and, and I was shoot away to go home and I was riding my bike around Lakeshore Drive and I looked up at a crescent moon and I went, <laughs> Glenn's dad is there. <laughs> oh, and he's going to be famous. <laughs> it was, it, you know, so it was a, a moment at which I realized the enormity of the undertaking uh, that we were all involved in. And uh, so you knew the danger, yeah. but you didn't necessarily, I'm sure you focus on not that part of what's going on, but just making sure you could support your father in whatever efforts he was trying to account. Right. NASA kept the astronauts very busy flying around their T-38s to uh, uh, training uh, opportunities and, to, and, and uh, to, to meet with contractors and, and public appearances. And, you know, outside of Clear Lake, they were stars. You right. know, and, and Florida was like the Hollywood destination for astronauts. But uh, uh, for us kids, it, I mean, it, in Clear Lake, they were just dad. <laughs> um, it was a lot like living around a, a military base where everybody's dad is involved in something important. Mm -hmm. it, it's, a, it's an important mission. And right. we all know that. And we all feel that sense of responsibility to the mission. I saw the pictures of your dad early on with the Apollo uh, patch and also a picture of you with you, a little kid, in this picture. I don't know which one you are. <laughs> They're all cute, so what the heck, you know. But there was, you have the, uh, the patch and he, and when he first came into the program there, so uh, what was the most memorable part? Obviously, he didn't get on 19, but he went to Space Lab, which yeah, was... Skylab. Skylab, right. which was the uh, precursor to um, it was the America's space first, station. Yeah, America's first space station. And uh, uh, the fact that he, he was on orbit for 84 days um, was, uh, you know, that was a record that was not broken for a long time. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. we were very, very proud of that. Uh, 
the, the, the Skylab was, and, and I learned more about this during my years at NASA as an adult than I did uh, as a child. Uh, I mean, I, I was 15 and I had a, a pretty good understanding of what they were doing and why they were there, but I didn't right. realize at the time, and how could I, that they were really setting standards for how we were going to do research in space, how we were going to enhance human productivity in space, things that became important during the shuttle program and now critical aboard the International Space Station. And at some point, you became a voice of NASA. We could hear your voice when things were happening there. How did you get right. to that position and what did that entail? Well, um, it, it kind of stemmed from my father's mission. Uh, we were told a couple days before splashdown that the networks, this, you and I remember when there were only three, right? Sure. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the networks were not going to cover the splashdown live. And this was the first time in the history of the space program that that had taken place. I wrote a letter to the president of each network, making my case and appealing their decision to do that. The interesting thing was I got a letter back from the three of them that was almost as if they had compared notes. They told me that while the accomplishments of your father and his crew are certainly most noteworthy, we, d we bear the pressure of determining every day what is newsworthy. And I thought, wow, who gave you that power? <laughs> yeah. and, and that led me to a career path that I, I, you know, I couldn't see it, but I knew it, it was going to be, it was going to have to do with, with media and storytelling and being a part of setting the American agenda. And I was just about to go to work for McCann Erickson here in Houston as a traffic, you know, uh, guy. And uh, I heard about a, a, a job opening at the Johnson Space Center with the audiovisual contractor. I had a art radio television film degree from Texas. I walked in and I got hired as a technical director. I didn't know what that meant, <laughs> but that's really how it started. And I had the opportunity then to work for NASA as a commentator. Well, I'm, I'm going to talk more about that. In fact, you, you know, I'm a geek about this. Many of you are too. Admit it. You know you are. Uh, we're going to do the Newsmakers Extra. So we go to the Newsmakers page on clicktohouston.com. You can see the rest of our conversation because there's much more to come on this. Thank